think all law firms are the same. My name is Mark Victor, and I'm here to tell you that my law firm is different. Why are we different? Because we're a pro-freedom law firm. So I know there's still some people in line, that's fine, uh, but if we can just get quiet so we can go ahead and get started or else uh, we might go a little bit long. So, uh, welcome everybody to here to this debate. Um, thanks for, for coming out. Um, this, this debate is put on by the Federal Society, the ASU student chapter of the Federal Society. The Federal Society is a nonpartisan, conservative, and libertarian organization dedicated to freedom, federalism, and judicial restraint. The Society does not take policy positions on any proposed or passed legislation, nor does it weigh in on court cases. The Federal Society seeks to educate the legal community through its programs and publications about how limited constitutional government, based on the rule of law, can have a positive effect on law and public policy. Uh, just as a side note, I, I kind of set this debate up on purpose uh, to where we, we would have a conservative and, and a libertarian more debating to, so that everybody could see that within the, the federal society itself, there are many conflicting views. I, as, if I recall, just my memory was part of the federal society in law school, I could be wrong, I'm not sure about Mr. Victor as well. So here we have two former Federal Society members that obviously do not agree on at least one issue. I would assume there are others, but I'm not sure about that. Um, as far as the food goes, like I said, we kind of set it over to the side, so feel free to go grab a little bit more. Uh, just try to be as unobtrusive in making it so that everybody can stay focused down here uh, during the debate. We also recognize that there are a number of groups and organizations here present. Uh, because there are quite a few, I'm not going to be able to recognize them all individually, but just recognize that we have uh, anti-drug groups, pro-drug groups, uh, obviously the prosecutor's office and the defense bar represented, and many others. So thank you for coming to our school and uh, to uh, observe this Federal Society debate. Um, one, one thing, we would ask everyone to include a civil audience we're here to watch a debate. We're not here to watch all of you or listen to you and whether you agree or disagree with what they're saying. Please hold all applause until the very end. Um, and, and please just be civil and, and as silent and quiet as possible during the debate. Afterwards, there will be time for some question and answers. If you don't agree with something that is said, feel free to write it down. And then at the end, we'll, we'll try to get a question from you about it. But during the debate, we're going to be focused on these two gentlemen up here. Um, this time, I'd like to present them both. Uh, or first of all, uh, the format of the debate, I'll, I'll let you know the format of the debate. First, we're going to have Mr. Victor speak for 10 minutes. And he is going to open with uh, why marijuana should be legalized. And then Mr. Montgomery is going to have a 12 minute response. Then Mr. Victor will have 10 more minutes, followed by Mr. Montgomery with for 8 minutes. And then Mr. Victor will be given 5 minute closing argument, and Mr. Montgomery will be giving 5 minute closing argument after that. Uh, I will ask them to try to be as timely as possible. We are getting started about 10 minutes late already. So I will give them a, about a 1 minute warning. Just to let you know, I'll be sitting right over here. I'll give you a 1 minute warning, and then we will end right, right at the, the required time. Um, Mr. Victor is, a, is an ASU graduate. He graduated summa cum laude, and then he graduated from the Southwestern University School of Law. He is a Desert Storm veteran from the Marine Corps and a certified specialist in criminal law. He's been a criminal defense attorney for 17 years, and uh, he was formerly a jo judge pro tem. Rather an interesting story about uh, his, I believe it was about a half hour that he lasted in that position. He, he refused to hear some, some drug cases and was then asked to uh, step down from that position. So uh, he, he's represented in clients in more than a thousand major felony cases, including first and second degree murder, sex cases, gun cases, major drug cases, and complex white collar cases. Jury trial experience includes several murder trials, including death eligible matters, as well as complex sex cases. Mark J. Victor has represented clients in many high profile and media attention cases. Uh, Mr. Montgomery graduated
graduated through the top of his high school class and became the first graduate to attend the United States Military Academy at West Point, New York, oh, from wow. his high school class. He, his leadership style was subsequently tested on the battlefield as a tank platoon leader during Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm, where he led missions protecting U.S. operations from Iraqi forces. He was awarded a Bronze Star Medal for meritorious service for his contribution to the liberation of Kuwait and was later promoted to the rank of Captain, ultimately rising to the rank of Major while serving in the Individual Ready Reserve. Following his military service and work in the private sector, Bill earned his JD from ASU Law School as well, graduating magna cum laude and receiving, receiving the prestigious Order of the Coy. He went to work for the Maricopa County Attorney's Office where he quickly gained a reputation as an aggressive prosecutor and tireless advocate for victims' rights, garnering tough sentences for felony drunk drivers, serious repeat felons, and gang members. He also supervised prosecutions in the Auto Theft Bureau, which recorded a 35% drop in auto theft under his leadership. Bill Montgomery was elected Maricopa County Attorney in 2010 on a pledge to fight crime, honor victims' rights, and protect and strengthen our community. Bill has helped shape legislation designed to protect victims of crime and perform a child protective services, and he continues to be a passionate advocate for victims' rights in Arizona as Maricopa County Attorney. He currently resides in Gilbert, Arizona with his wife and their children. And I believe that Mr. Victor also has children. I did not mention that, but there's two. Five. Five. Whoa. There we go. More than two by a lot. Um, well, one thing I, I would point out, we've been asked not to film this debate. Uh, Mr. Montgomery is currently participating in legislation or in litigation regarding the Arizona uh, medical marijuana issue. And so because of the, how related they are, we are going to ask that people do not record what goes on, though. Obviously, we are grateful for both of these men for coming and being willing to, to debate this issue in front of all of us. So thanks to them. And we will start. Mr. Victor, you can begin. Mr. Montgomery gets up here and says he disagrees with that. 
But there's a last point that I'm wondering if Mr. Montgomery will agree with me or not. See, I think that we are never, ever, ever, ever going to win the drug war. And I'm wondering if Mr. Montgomery will agree with me on that point. Because, you know, as far as I can tell, I've only been doing this 17 years, but as far as I can tell, nobody thinks that we are going to win the drug war. Nobody. Not just criminal defense attorneys. I have occasion fairly often to talk to DEA agents, people from the Drug Enforcement Agency, whose job it is full time to eradicate drugs from the United States. They're scouring the earth to eradicate that, uh, not just that green plant that grows all drugs. And I asked them privately, hey, psst, do you think we're going to win this drug war? They laugh. It's a joke. Do you know, I've never once found a DEA agent, not one, who thinks we're going to win the drug war. I can't find a police officer who thinks that. I can't even find a prosecutor who thinks that. You know, I've talked to prosecutors whose job exists because of federal drug grants. And I say, hey, we're going to win? Get close? Making any progress? You think it's going to happen? I can't find one who privately would tell me they're going to win the drug war. What about judges? They don't have an axe to grind, right? You know how often it is I'm back in chambers, usually on some stupid drug case, and I have a chance to talk to the judge and say, hey judge, I think we're ever going to win this drug war. How's it going? I can't find anybody. So if Mr. Montgomery disagrees with me, I, as a citizen, would like to know when. It's been over 40 years we've been playing around with this drug war. We're now up to $69 billion a year. When is it going to end? And how is it going to end? I want to know, what new fresh ideas does Mr. Montgomery bring to the table? We've tried tougher sentences. We've tried more money. We've tried longer incarceration. And we've changed the law. We've pretty much destroyed the Fourth Amendment. Virtually any time a police officer wants to pull somebody over and search your vehicle, bring a drug dog around to alert, maybe, maybe not, to look for that green leafy substance, it happens. So what new ideas is he going to bring? What else is there that can be tried? And also I'd like to know, what on earth is the definition of winning the drug war? Is it when everybody's in prison? Is it when everybody's in prison or working for the drug war? Do you know they can't even win the drug war in prison? I've got people who go to prison for theft cases, I mean, nothing to do with drugs and become out addicts. It's just not going to happen. Ending the drug war will accomplish all these goals. First off, this is a freedom issue. The bottom line is this. Free people own themselves. They own their bodies, their time, their money. They get to decide how they want to live for themselves. They're in charge of themselves. Free people get to weigh risks and costs and benefits and decide for themselves whether they want to engage in conduct. They think for themselves. They're not looking for the government to take care of them from cradle to grave. They don't want Mr. Montgomery or some other politician or their neighbor or the majority to tell them how to live their lives. They don't want to be told what they can put in their own body. Of course, freedom is not without responsibilities. Free people uh, don't need to trespass on other people to be free. I'm sure Mr. Montgomery will point out uh, that freedom uh, may involve some trespass on other people's rights. It doesn't. I'm not advocating that. I don't care if you're high or drunk or tired or mad. You don't get to violate another person's right. This debate is really about the role of government. Federalists say the government should be limited. Of course it should be limited. They are our agents. We don't need the government to save us from ourselves. Free people don't beg for rights. The drug war is simply incompatible with a free society. Besides, it doesn't work. You know what helps? It does help some people. It does accomplish some things. It helps drug dealers, in gangs, in cartels, and it helps drug cops. If you're a drug cop, you love the drug war. If you're a drug prosecutor, if you're a criminal defense attorney, I plead guilty. I make a lot of money off the drug war. If you support prisons, if your job is part of the prison complex, you love the drug war. But the drug war has been a complete disaster by any measure. It's wasting money for over 40 years. We have 4% of the world's population and yet 
25% of the world's prison population. 2.3 million people in prison now. Enough is enough. Today, do fewer people use drugs? No. More people use drugs today than before the drug war. There was a recent study. They asked school kids, how hard is it to get marijuana? You know what they said? Easier to get marijuana than either alcohol or cigarettes. What would you expect? They're easy to get even in prison. We shouldn't be surprised, right? I mean, the drug war encourages violence. It creates a black market. How are they going to solve, solve disputes other than with guns? But we know this already. We already had the alcohol war. Remember the alcohol war? You don't. If you're on the other side of this debate, you don't. The alcohol war went from 1919 to 1933. A complete disaster. <laughs> Unless you were an organized crime, it was fabulous for you. The best thing that ever happened to you was the prohibition on alcohol. Violence increased, alcoholism increased. Law enforcement running around chasing people drinking beer. Of course alcohol is still a problem, but it's easy to get rehab. If you fall off the bandwagon, no problem, you're not going to prison. Have we seen the Miller guy and the Budweiser guy fighting each other when they bring their drugs to the corner? Are they having turf wars? No. If they get into a dispute, do they fight with violence in the streets? No. They go to court. They don't have, there's nobody offering large cash bonuses to transport alcohol across the country. Stats are that fewer people would use alcohol or in marijuana if it was legal. Before I close, and I'm running out of time, 10 minutes goes by fast, I would like to know something from Mr. Montgomery. Mr. Montgomery, given that you have discretion to allocate prosecutorial resources, and given that there are still lots of violent bad guys running around the streets, don't you think the citizens of Maricopa County would be much safer if you took resources that you are currently using to chase around pot smokers and devote them to getting murderers and rapists and real bad guys instead? Woo! I want to know when ever are we going to achieve the goals of the drug war? When are we going to stop drugs with the drug war? Is the answer never? We both know it is. And finally, isn't $69 billion better spent on almost anything, including it back to the free people who earned it? Maybe on rehab or prevention or schools or anything other than throwing it down the rat hole of the failed drug war. Thank you. Uh, and as far as that point goes, uh, 
I, I believe that Mr. Ricker and I would agree. I don't think that that's necessarily a governmental duty, but it winds up becoming a community responsibility that we all then share a piece of. Another important thing to point out, too, is that Mr. Victor is confusing freedom with license. Freedom in our society is not the freedom to do anything you want. That would be license. And the founders of this country knew very well that that was not what they were putting together. In fact, John Adams, the first member and only member of the Federalist Party elected president, said it very well that our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. And James Madison also adroitly observed that if men were angels, we would not need government. If men were angels and 100% responsible, we wouldn't need a lot of the laws that we have on the books that limit what people can do because of the consequences to others. If you were to look at the libertarian position on the use of force by government, you would see that it basically says that as long as you're not trespassing, using force, or fraud against no other property, there's no role for government. If that were taken to its logical conclusion, you would not be able to do anything to a parent who withheld food or medical care from their child. They're not using force, they're not trespassing. How can government proactively dictate to that person what to do in being a parent if they made a choice to do something different. You see, this is where libertarianism diverges from something interesting to talk over over a beer versus the ability to take that philosophy and implement in rational public policy decisions that will accomplish things that are permissible for government to be involved in. We are a free society, but we're not a society in which we can act with complete license to do whatever we want to do. And it was well recognized as well at the founding of this country that among the first and foremost responsibilities for government is to see the public safety so that within that community, we are free to exercise our individual liberties. Now, on the practical side of the issue, the reality is that we already have two destructive legal drugs, alcohol and tobacco, with nicotine. And we can see the destructive nature of those two drugs and their legal use. Alcohol-related crashes kill someone in the U.S. every 22 minutes. In any one minute, one of 50 drivers on the road is drunk. Alcohol-related accidents are the leading cause of deaths among young people. Drunk drivers are responsible for half highway fatal injuries. About two-thirds of people arrested in larger cities for felonies test positive for illegal drugs as well. And more than half of all confirmed abuse reports and 75% of child deaths involve alcohol abuse or drug use on the part of parents. With respect to tobacco, and mind you, the health care costs associated with alcohol, a legal drug, run in the billions, lost productivity, treatment centers, rehab, the harm done to families, the harm done to others, vehicular crashes, other sorts of violent crimes, all associated with a legal drug. Tobacco. People who die each year from their own cigarette smoking, several hundred thousand. Annual health care expenditures solely from secondhand smoke exposure, almost five billion. Total annual public and private health care expenditures caused by smoking. Almost a hundred billion annual federal and state government smoking caused Medicaid payments, just over 30 billion. Federal government smoking caused Medicare expenditures, just over 27 billion. Health care costs to the VA for smoking related illnesses, almost 10 billion. These are all things that are legal now. Knowing those costs, knowing those impacts to our society, why in heaven's name would we deliberately add a third, knowing ahead of time? what those costs and what that impact would be as well. We know that the law is a moral teacher. What we say is okay will result in people doing what we say is okay. We have enough teen use of alcohol and tobacco. There's currently enough teen use of marijuana and other drugs. And mind you, 
in the 15 states that have passed some version of the Medical Marijuana Act, teen drug use went up. The number of fatalities associated with impaired driving went up. We're smart enough to be able to look at those scenarios and understand that legalizing yet one more drug is just going to add to the panoply of costs, impact to communities, and the impact to our youth. We're smart enough to just say no. Now, with respect to the drug war too, an incredibly stupid phrase. We have not had a war on drugs. If we were going to have a war, we would attack the enemy's center of gravity. We would eradicate the poppy fields, the cocoa fields, the marijuana fields. We'd take them out. And we would go after those responsible for the production and distribution. And we would kill them if it was a war. It's not. We've had a terrible policy approach. We've gone back and forth to extremes. But in Arizona, our approach is very different. Our approach is treatment-based. At the end of 2009, there were only 65 people out of 400,000 in Arizona's prisons who were there because of a possession or use conviction. 94.2% who were there were there for a violent or repeat felony. Would I like the prison population to be less? Yes, but only if that was a consequence of there being less crimes committed in the first place. I'm not going to shift the cost of crime from prisons to local communities to have to deal with repeat offenders at that point. So I would say that the libertarian position on drug use doesn't meet practical reality. Freedom is not license. And knowing the harms of marijuana, knowing the addictive properties, and it is, knowing the long-term physical effects, knowing the fact that youth who begin drug use early with marijuana do graduate to more serious or addictive drugs later, it is a gateway drug. <laughs> knowing all that, <laughs> knowing all that, it makes no sense for us as a rational society and community to deliberately put another hole in our heads and legalize marijuana or any other drug. <coughs>
I had people in class with me in law school who were using marijuana almost every day. I also know some prosecutors who use marijuana every day. <laughs> Mr. Montgomery <laughs> noted that the drug war is really a stupid phrase, and I absolutely agree with that. Let's call it what it is. It's the government's war on the citizens. Yes. That's Woo! And part of the problem here is confusing two things. Mr. Montgomery confuses the dangerous aspects of some drugs. And by the way, I would be remiss if I didn't point out the number of people since the beginning of time who have died from marijuana use. Zero. Zero. I can also tell you the number of people who have come through my office in 17 years committing a violent crime involving marijuana. Zero. The number of people come through my office who are charged with an aggravated assault because they smoked marijuana, got out, went into a car accident? Zero. More from alcohol than I could count. I mean, the case that marijuana is horribly addictive and a gateway drug and dangerous and will ruin your life is, is uh, feeble based on stills at best. You know, Mr. Montgomery wants to... Um, put together this issue that drugs are bad and therefore they should be illegal. Lots of things are bad, ladies and gentlemen. Hydrogenated oils are bad. Fats are bad. Sitting on your butt not going to the gym in the morning is bad. Lots of things are bad. But in a free society, the government's job isn't to root out everything that's bad for you. Free people get to decide for themselves how to live. Mr. Montgomery pointed out the uh, rather rational, I think, observation that we have all these social programs. We shouldn't have these social programs. I'm the first one to say, look, if you use a drug, if you ride your motorcycle without your helmet and you fall down and go boom and get a head injury, it's not my responsibility to take care of you. It's not Mr. Montgomery's responsibility to take care of you. He pointed out the terrible health care costs of some of these drugs. I agree with that. Maybe Mr. Montgomery will join with me here today and we can have a unified position, which is let's both end the drug war and all of the attending social programs. Let's end them both and let's have a free society. Woo! Yeah, stop being a liberal. Libertarians have utopian views. Really? What's so utopian about you're in charge of you and I'm in charge of me? You get to do whatever you want with your body and your property and your time and your money and you don't have anything to say about mine. If we interact, we can do it peacefully. Is that so hard? Is that so convoluted? Is there so much theory there? Is it more utopian to say the government should have the right to initiate force against its own citizens? Is that a better scheme? It hasn't worked in 40 years. It's not going to work this year. And it's never going to work. Of course, you should be able to do anything you want with your own property. That doesn't mean you get to get in a car and drive drunk or drive high and increase a risk of harm to another person. Nobody supports that position. I certainly don't. If you do get high from smoking marijuana and you want to do something other than what I'm told most people do, which is sit around and listen to music and giggle and maybe have sex and things like that, <laughs> and eat popcorn or whatever else you eat, let's just say you're the only person on the planet who smokes marijuana and then gets violent and goes out and does something to infringe on another person's rights. You're the only person on the planet who does that. Because I've never heard of anybody else. You should be punished for your violent activities. Mr. Montgomery noted uh, Adams and Madison. Do you think they would have supported this drug war? The answer is hell no. Both of them were federalists. They understood the notion of federalism. They understood Article 1, Section 8 lays out the things the federal government does. Guess what I didn't see in there? Drug war. I didn't see drug war. Where was drug war? No, I didn't see alcohol war either. So what did they do? At least they were honest about it, right? They passed an amendment. Okay, it's okay. We hereby give the discretion, the power to the federal government to run the alcohol war. And as I've already pointed out, that really went well. <laughs> Lest you think this is just my position, this is just the position of a defense attorney who I absolutely promise you makes more money off the drug war than Mr. Montgomery or any judge in this state. I will read to you the position of thousands, 
thousands of former law enforcement drug cops and prosecutors. Leap, law enforcement against prohibition, against prohibition. Cops, former drug cops, are now saying, you know what, what I've been doing all those years, dumb. Here's what they say, and I'm quoting verbatim from their website. For four decades, the United States has fueled its policy of a war on drugs with over a trillion tax dollars and increasingly punitive policies. More than 39 million arrests for nonviolent drug offenses have been made. The incarcerated population quadrupled over a 20-year period, making building prisons the nation's fastest growing industry. More than 2.3 million United States citizens are currently in jail or prison, far more per capita than any country in the world. The United States has 4.6% of the population of the world, but 22.5% of the world's prisoners. Each year, this war costs the United States another $70 billion. Am I out of time? Okay, I guess I'll have to finish this next. Thank you. And again, I can't underscore this point enough. Freedom is not license. 
we are not free to do anything that we want to be. The Founding Fathers' understanding of what it was to be a rational moral actor and man in our natural world understood that there had to be limits to what we were to do in order to be the men and women that we were created to be. So just telling people that you could do whatever you wanted to do was false. And even then, you know, think of the scarlet letter, think of the stockade, think of being whipped in public for moral offenses. We don't do that now, but that was going on at the time that our country was founded and thereafter. So to try to disassociate the fact that our actions are limited by an understanding of what our nature should be in community with one another, from being able to do whatever you want to do, that's a different philosophy, that's a different approach. It's not consistent with the founding traditions and principles of this country. So this is a full philosophical approach that is not consistent with who we are as a nation. And efforts to push that have very real and, for those who want to promote it, intended consequences. And again, I would just say that knowing the consequences and the costs for legal substances now, it makes absolutely no sense to add one more. And I would also underscore the point, too, that at least in Arizona, and I dare say at least a few other states, they're not populated by people who have committed drug offenses. They're not. They're there for violent and repeat offenders. So to try to make the argument that we should legalize marijuana because it would reduce, or any other drug, because it would reduce our prison population, is a false premise. Our prisons aren't populated with it in the first place. The rational, responsible approach is to say that we do not condone illicit use of drugs. We do not condone that kind of behavior and the crime associated with it. It will be there whether you legalize it or not. It's another false promise for this argument. <coughs> we are a moral religious people. We are worthy of the Constitution we have. And we're worthy of believing in the freedom that we have as Americans. <coughs>
buy into this misstatement. And really, killing more people is the solution? Killing more people is how we're going to ramp up and fight the drug war? I, for one, would prefer a civilized society where people aren't killed so that we can save them from themselves. And to say a black market would still exist is also a misstatement. It's true that there is a black market in alcohol and for tobacco cigarettes. But do you know why? Because you can't ignore economics. When you tax the snot out of something and you make the price so much higher than what would be the free market price, you have created an artificial black market. Yeah. Here's the black market in Amsterdam. I've been there three times. I'm going to tell you how that goes in just a second. You know, I ought to be the very first guy in favor of the drug war. I make a bunch of money on the drug war. Why am I against the drug war? Because it's simply best for our country to end. It is just not compatible with a free society. It's okay if you say you like the drug war, but don't also say in the same sense you're for a free society, because you are not. True. It's a national embarrassment. It's been a tragedy. It's ruined lives. We have, they have turned us from the land of the free into the land of the incarcerated. We are not the land of the free. It's a lie. It's killing our justice system. The courts are packed. I was in the arraignment court this morning. I think there were 180 matters on the calendar, all for 830. It's almost every day. So many of them are drug cases. It's bogging our system down. It's taking money away from going after real bad guys. If you're asking the wrong question, it doesn't matter what the answer is. The question is not whether these drugs are bad for you. The question is, would society be improved by legalizing it. Marijuana doesn't ruin people's lives. The drug war ruins people's lives. 17 years as a criminal defense attorney, thousands of cases, not one case involving marijuana and violence. Most of the crimes that I get that I defend people on, they're cases like possession for sale, transportation for sale, production for sale. They're all these sort of ancillary things that go on as a result of the drug war. That's what the real problem is. The real problem is the drug war. There are, of course, are lots of people, good people, who smoke pot. Lots of them have lost their financial aid. If you're here and you're in school, and you're in school pursuing some degree to do something great in the world, and you get caught smoking pot, if Mr. Montgomery has his way, you're going to lose your financial aid. Mm. Great. Just to save you from yourself. Thanks, Dad. You know how many lost jobs we have? People with felonies on records. People who have lost their civil rights can't vote, can't possess firearms. They're in prison. They're fined. Their property is seized or said another way, stolen from them by the government. They're labeled criminals. The drug war ruined their lives, not the marijuana. There are countless productive people who smoke weed. They're your neighbors. They're peaceful people. They are in all walks of life, and they are using it recreationally, just for the fun of it, because they're Americans, and they're free, and they can damn well do whatever they want with their own bodies. What's the problem? I've been to Amsterdam three times. Yeah. I've yeah. been there as somebody who's a criminal oh, defense attorney for 17 years. There's a public years. building. I was a justice study major right here at ASU. I'm interested in this stuff. That was a public building. I witnessed I'm, I'm part of the public. deals in Amsterdam. Would you mind coming you know in? No, go? I do mind. Somebody walks in and says, hey, I'm going to continue to videotape. There's a public big building. There's a discussion. There's a public building. I'm part of the public. I have a right to And then the drugs are bought. There's even a microscope. You can look at the merchandise. And you know what? There's no games. Do whatever you want. There's no guns. There's no violence. Do whatever you want. There's no arrests. There's no problem. There's no need to pay a criminal defense attorney. Nobody's going to jail. The cops just walk right by, and there's no problem. And there's no black market in Amsterdam until 1 o'clock. When the legal market closes, then guess what happens? The black market shows up. You want to buy marijuana in Amsterdam after 1 o'clock? You're buying it in the streets. The drug war, in my opinion, is flat out on unconstitutional. It's disgusting. I talk to drug dealers all the time. They love the drug war. They love the drug war. They do not want it to end. They agree with Mr. Montgomery. The big time drug dealers, they are on Mr. Montgomery's side of this debate. They know they can't compete with large corporations. 
Where are the alcohol dealers? Where are the gangs? Where are the cartels pushing alcohol? Where's the violence and alcohol? If you support the drug war, you support the drug dealers. That's the side you're on. It doesn't serve a worthwhile goal. The costs and money and human lives are incalculable. It's anti-freedom, it's un-American, it's been a terrible mistake, a horrible disaster, and it is finally time in this country for us to wake up and start putting human liberty first. What is your name? I'm afraid I what is your name? What is your name? What is your name? What is your name? 
My name is Shelly Soto. Okay, and what is your job? I'm an associate dean here at the law school. Okay. And I have been asked to tell you that because of the you're not going to be allowed to videotape, presenters have asked you to turn, to turn the video camera off. Is there a law against what he's doing? If you do not keep, if you do not do, if you do not turn off the video camera, mm -hmm. we need to ask you to leave. Okay, well, and what if I, what if? And, and the police are going to charge you with trespass if you do really? not complete. Okay, what about all the other people that are videotaping? Anybody videotaping okay. has to cease and desist. Well, it's already been recorded now. It's already been recorded. Just I'm going to put it on YouTube. You're going to get a million hits on yeah. anyway. Go ahead and take Possibly it down. So. Go ahead and take it down. So, okay, so Just you're saying this it's is... over. It's over now. Go ahead and okay. go ahead and kill it. Okay. We got what we wanted. To create your own, your own utopian society where people don't use drugs by using the force of government. You're trying to create your own utopia where people don't use trans fats, where people use government force to create your own society. What? By the power of the majority through a vote? Not through the minority. It's the minority through it's a vote. It's actually the minority right now. The minority of the ruling class, the plundering class, to steal from everybody else. And how can you say that people who are thrown in prison in, in prison don't create more problems and create more people on the welfare system? Montgomery's a typical liberal using government. No, he's you a communist. Government communist. You from it, dude. Communist. You're a big government fa a favorite. You're the big government. Apologist. I just went to him to ask him. Uh, I would like to know where I can go to get a license, uh, to apply for a license for freedom, because that's what he said. Uh -huh. Another important thing to point out, too, is that Mr. Victor is confusing freedom with license. Freedom in our society is not the freedom to do anything you want. That would be license. License for freedom? Where do I go? I almost asked the That would have been a good one. The dumb guy. What do you want to look for? He said it's not a license, though, right? Yeah, he said, well, there is a license for freedom. Okay, where do I go to apply? Right. <laughs> well, it's called you got to become part of the government cabal. They're criminals. You think all law firms are the same. My name is Mark Victor, and I'm here to tell you that my law firm is different. Why are we different? Because we're